Hello, welcome to Focus Friday at the Lika Ratner Museum of Art at St. Petersburg College. I'm Christine Rank Carter. I'm the executive director of the museum. And today we have a Focus Friday, which is led by a docent from the museum and held on the first Friday of every month, which highlights a work from the museum's permanent collection. For the month of October, 2022, we celebrate LBGTQ History Month. Museum docent Charlotte Matusiak presents British artist Sir Gordon Howard Elliott Hodgkin's etching Books for the Paris Review, which is part of the Jim and Martha Sweeney Contemporary Print Collection. Now take it away, Charlotte. Hi, welcome to the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. My name again is Charlotte, and I will be traveling with you as we explore the life and legacy of British artist Howard Hodgkin. Gordon Howard Elliott Hodgkin was born August 6, 1932 in London. His father Elliott was a manager for the chemical company, Imperial Chemical Industries, and was an amateur horticulturist. And his mother Catherine was a botanical illustrator. His great, great, great grandfather was Thomas Hodgkin, who described the glandular disease later called Hodgkin's disease. In 1940, at the age of eight, his mother sent him and his sister Anne to New York to escape the war in England. It was here that a friend of his mother's took him to the Museum of Modern Art. And it was then that he realized at still a very young age that he wanted to be a painter, not a diplomat as his mother wished. After World War I, a relative paid for him to go to Eton. He enjoyed working with his art teacher, Wilfred Blunt, who introduced him to the art and culture of India, a country he learned to love, and visited and painted many times. But overall, he was unhappy at Eton and kept running away. After a session with a psychiatrist, his parents transferred him to Bryanston. His new art teacher was Charles Henley Reed. He continued his interest in art but he was still unhappy and again, kept running away. His formal education began when his parents sent him to Camberwell Art School and then to Bath Academy of Art in Gorsham. Hodgkin produced his first painting, Memoirs, at the age of 17. It depicts the artist listening to a family friend nicknamed Aunt Betty, who was lying on a couch. The scene is her home in Long Island where Hodgkin lived as a wartime evacuee, a place that he revisited in the summer of 1947 at the age of 15, just prior to producing this work. Hodgkin said that while creating this work, he realized that his subject matter would be memories. The artist later said of this painting, it took me years to get back to the intensity of that picture, but I wanted to get there from another direction. I wanted to use paint as a substance. Many critics even today consider this to be one of his best works. Hodgkin is often associated with the School of London movement. The School of London, however, was more of a social group which included such artists as Francis Bacon and David Hockney and less of an artistic style. These artists chose to explore human form and the devastated landscape in the wake of the destruction wrecked by war. They attempted to reconcile re recent history. They tried to imagine new ways of seeing oneself in one's fellow human being. These artists were influenced by the old masters, but wanted to give their subjects a seriousness that felt current and recognizable. Under pressure from the community, he, like many closeted gay men of his time, felt pressured into a heterosexual lifestyle. He tried to hide his sexual preferences by marrying Julia Lane, a fellow student at Gorsham in 1955. They had two sons, Lewis and Sam. He taught over the next few years at various art schools and eventually became a trustee at the Tate Gallery in London from 1970 to 1976. He was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1977 for his service to the community and contributions to the art world. He served as a trustee at the National Gallery London from 1978 to 1985. 
Despite all these activities and awards, he never lost his love for travel. In his 40s, he spent some time in India and took a renewed interest in the traditional painting of that country. Indian Tree was a mural he created for the British Council building in New Delhi, a shadowy representation of a great banyan tree that seems to be growing in and around the building. The banyan is a native tree of India, can often be found in the early works of his Indian collection. As was often the case, Hodgkin would later recreate his work in the form of prints. Howard Hodgkin later said when we calling his first trip to India. I spent my first night in India asleep on a bedding roll on the station platform. It proved a revelation. It changed my way of thinking and probably the way I paint. As a side note, many of Hodgson's prints were done using carborium technique. Carborundum calgraph creates the image above the surface of the matrix. In this case, aluminum. A paste is made by mixing silicon carbide with acrylic base that is painted onto the matrix, creating the image much like painting. Once dried, this holds the ink. The wiping and printing are done the same as etching. Howard preferred this method of printmaking as it allowed him to retain the surface qualities of the wood on which he liked to paint. Back in England, he fell ill with a disease caused by a parasite that he picked up while eight years earlier in India. After a major operation, he went through a period of depression. He was frustrated with his teaching career choices and the lack of response to his first solo exhibition in London in 1962. He knew he was gay, even throughout his marriage, and the internal emotions began to surface. In 1975, he decided to make it known that he was gay. He left his wife of 20 years, something that affected him and his work for the rest of his life. As a friend, Nicholas Serrata said, I think coming out as gay helped his work enormously. He relaxed and his work became more expressive and open. Hodgkin often denied that this coming out was a direct connection to his mature works. However, many of the works of his time had sexual overtones. Clean sheets done in dark greens and blacks suggest a somber, dreamlike setting, almost nightmarish. As one New York critic expressed, we seem to have come in at the beginning of a disquieting drama between an upright and reclining figure. In response, Hodgkin stated, it's just the interior of a bedroom. But as another critic put it, it is full of Friday night thoughts. For a while, his love life became more public than his artistic life, as he seemed to fall in in love with unsuitable men. However, in 1983, he settled down with the music writer and critic, Antony Piatti, with whom he remained until his death. During the 1960s, his artistic technique began to mature. He developed a highly semi-abstract style with loosely represented figures an increasingly obscure subject matter. He became, in his words, a representational painter, not a painter of appearances. It was also during this time that his interest in print mainly expanded and started taking on new directions for his artistic outlook. The prints were done in shades of gray and then color was added to each print. Thus he combined his love of painting with his newfound love of print mainly by hand coloring his prints, some of which he did, but most of which were done by artists under the supervision. He saw an example of this with Indian Tree. He felt held his first retrospective exhibition in 1976 at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. Retrospective exhibitions were not something he enjoyed. Over time, he began thinking of them as a kind of death. He hated talking about his paintings, perhaps because his works were glimpses into his personal life and travels. It is said that during one interview, he became so frustrated with the constant questions about 
What does it mean? That he took a brush with some paint and put a mark on the image, thus changing it to something else. He is often quoted as saying, for an artist, time can always be regained because by an act of imagination, you can always go back. Even though his subject matters became more obscure, he didn't lose his initial objective that his paintings would be reflections of his memories. And often his titles reflected that feeling. The title always a clue to the picture, each referencing an experience. For example, in 1980, he visited his friend David Hockney in California. As was often the case after a journey, his work was reminiscent of his time spent there. In DH in Hollywood, the reds, greens, and pink suggest a fanciful star-studded world. You can almost see a glamorous movie star be decked in jewels in the background. You can almost feel the excitement of opening night with its glamour, brightly lit marquee, and numerous flash bulbs. But the subject matter is becoming more obscure and being left to the imagination of the viewer to fill in the details. Egypt was also a place he visited often. Here we again, we see his fanciful use of imagery and even more obscure subject matter. The use of brilliant reds and greens and the genie-like figure in the middle could evoke memories of Aladdin on his colorful flying carpet or any story from the Arabian Nights. Valentine might suggest romance with its tondo shape, the Cupid's arrow and the grapes, perhaps a reference to wine, something often found at romantic interludes. The dark imagery perhaps lost or faded love, maybe a flashback to his own marriage. But some people, critics believe its dark image with an arrow pointing to what could be people standing against a wall could also allude to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Again, the interpretation is left to the viewer. In all of these, we can see the subtle change from the stark figure of memoirs to more obscure scenarios. Hodgkin preferred painting on wood. One reason for painting on wood was that it allowed for extensive revisions, far more so than canvas. When asked about his preference for wood, he replied, once a painting is finished, I feel it should be strong enough to look after itself in the outside world. So a picture as a lump of wood seems reasonably logical. However, in the 1980s, art critics began suggesting to Hodgkin that over time, wood could dry up, warp or split, thereby ruining or destroying the piece. Hodgkin sought out other platforms for his work. One such platform was Duralite, a sandwich type board consisting of a honeycomb interior and plywood type front and back. Much like more durable cardboard boxes or packing material, it provided the wood texture he preferred with the durability he desired. His first major work done on this medium is rain. This work demonstrates the dynamic style that he achieved at the height of his career. The brushwork is broader and the use of color is focused. It seems less concerned with producing a seti as the ones we just viewed, but seems to generate a sense of depth and emotion. We begin to see the lack of subject matter and the emergence of the gem-like qualities of his later works. He was quoted as saying, when I finished the picture, I came out of my studio thinking nothing would be the same again. He also had this growing interest in how a piece was framed and displayed. In many instances, his painting flowed onto the framework and became part of the wall on which it hung. There is no boundary separating the art and the wall. At times, he even had the walls of the exhibition hall painted to complement or supplement the colors of the painting. He was nominated for and received his knighthood in 1992 for doing inspirational and outstanding work that goes above and beyond that of his peers. He did on occasion produce commissioned works. One such commission was a fundraiser for the New York cultural magazine, The Paris Review. 
The Paris Review is a quarterly English literary magazine established in Paris in 1953. The magazine headquarters moved from Paris to New York in 1973 and is still located in New York. The magazine was in constant financial difficulties. Since the creators wanted to have a criticism-free environment for artistic work of all kinds, they chose not to sell commercial space, but instead obtained financing from subscribers, sales of individual issues, grants and endowments, and the generosity of benefactors. Although receiving many awards and accolades, criticism arose claiming the magazine was conservative and bland, therefore limiting its potential impact. The grants and endowments began to dry up. New terms of funding were sought. Enter the fundraiser. Howard Hodgkin was approached and commissioned to create a series of prints for the magazine's 1999-2000 fundraising campaign. The resulting contribution was Books for the Paris Review. It was published in an edition of 10 prints and printed and painted by Jack Sharif, assisted by Andrew Smith and Claire Waite at the 107 workshop near Bath in England. It is a brightly colored image which suggests quick movements and the gem-like qualities of many of Hodgkin's paintings. It combines lift ground aqua tint in the corundum with hand coloring in 100% cotton paper from Two Rivers Paper Mill, Watch It, Somerset, handmade by Jim Patterson. According to Hodgkin, the artist is often tempted to alter an image through successive reinterpretations. In contrast, an assistant can be employed almost as a mechanical tool to duplicate marks. These marks always being done under close supervision of the artist. Books for the Paris Review was printed in black and gray and hand colored in red, blue, and green by Sharif with Hodgkin's guidance. The black marks suggesting wood are clearly seen as his technique of painting the frame as part of the picture. Unlike many of Hodgkin's prints and paintings, the title of this work was not drawn from memory or experience. It refers to the magazine for which it was to raise money. However, it is not unlikely that the image did come from a previous memory. I believe this print here to be one of the addition of 100 prints from 1997 to 1999. 20 of these prints were retained as printer's proofs. The other 80 were available for sale. It is signed HH and was printed at Workshop Wilshire, England as 54 slash 80 indicating that it might be number 54 of the 80 prints available. As I said, I can't be certain of this, but based on research on other prints, it's a good possibility. Another commissioned work of interest is New Worlds. His design, New Worlds, was used by the Royal Mail in 1999 for the 64 pence British postage stamp in its quartet of stamps celebrating the end of the millennium. Again, this was later reproduced in a limited series of editions. When I first saw this painting, I thought about that message that Captain Kirk repeats at the beginning of the original Star Trek series, our five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. I can almost see the Enterprise leaving the earth traveling through the blue sky, heading out into the darkness of space. Could this be what Hodgkin was saying? Let's boldly go into this new millennium with new hope and determination to explore new worlds of stage, music, literature, or new loves. Just as a little side note, we see the four quartet stamps here. The first one, the 19 pence, is the world of stage. It was done by British pop artist, Alan Jones. The 26 pence world of music was done by British op artist, Bridget Ryle. The 44 pence world of literature was by British subject artist, Lisa Milroy. And then we have the 64 pence new worlds. We enter into this new world 
not the fear and anxiety as we wait for first zone to enter into the year 2000 with this projected doom and gloom. We'll never know since he chose not to explain his paintings. It's up to you, the viewer, to decide. By this time, Hodgkin was in a wheelchair. He was well aware of his failing health and began thinking about his own mortality and his legacy. His works began to reflect those feelings. He produced several well-received retrospective exhibitions around the world. He began sharing a number of items in his personal Indian collections and many can be seen at the Ashmorelian Museum in Oxford. He continued producing new works until 2016, the year before he died. This work was one of the last completed pieces. It shows little activity, but is still a complex work. It appears incomplete or unfinished. It is done on wood, a platform is still preferred. Much of the wood can be seen through the broad brush strokes and part of the frame appears unpainted. It's almost as if he just stopped and left the painting as is, a moment in time. Could it just be a playful expression of time and feeling or light and dark or depth of emotion or a final sunset on an incomplete life? As mentioned earlier, the artist said of his paintings memoirs, it took me years to get back to the intensity, the feeling and emotions of that picture. But I wanted to get there from another direction. I wanted to use paint as a substance. When comparing his first painting with one of his last, I believe he achieved that goal. What do you think? Did he? Sir Gordon Howard Elliott Hodgkin died on March 9th, 2017. His influence on modern painters is yet to be fully understood, but it is certain his visual playfulness and use of vibrant colors will live on. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. That was absolutely wonderful and so informative. We uh, so appreciate your time in doing the research on this uh, particular artist, and we are looking forward to adding this information as research in our collection. For those of you who have joined us today, please join us again on November 4th for Native American Heritage Month, when we will be exploring the life and work of Andy Wil Wilbur, an artist from the Pacific Northwest, uh, and his piece from the collection, uh, Haida Ceremonial Mask. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.